next speaker is Peter Hopkins from um, Bond University. She's the manager of digital library services. Peter has a special interest in library technology and systems and how they support innovation of business processes and services. She has extensive experience across academic and public libraries, including five years of experience as an ICT project manager at the university. Please welcome Peter. I was going to say, that's not Peter. <laughs> You may have lost one of our introductions as well, because Jessie Donaghy, my colleague, is also going to be presenting. Yes. So, um, hi, <laughs> this is Jessie. <laughs> and Jessie is, in fact, going to start off. It's um, all right. Oh, I, I do have... I do have a bio for you. Okay. <laughs> Jessie is interested in exploring ways to enhance student learning within the academic environment and discovering new methods to engage customers with library services. Being new to the digital services role, Jessie brings her experiences as faculty librarian to technology planning and service delivery. In recent years, Peter and Jessie have collaborated on a journal article and two VALA conference papers. The most recent of these compared Primo and Summon interfaces through usability studies. Jessie also presented at the Igloo conference in 2016 on Primo analytics and information seeking behaviour. In January this year, Bond Library Services started preparations for launching the new user interface of Primo. Early this year, uh, sorry, early this month, it was introduced to the Bond University community. In this presentation, you will hear about some of the decision making and practicalities of, it, of this activity. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, so Peter and I are the digital library services team at Bond. So we're just going to share with you uh, 10 things about our experience with uh, implementing the new UI. And yeah, I'll talk about how that process went. So I'll be running through about half the things and then I'll hand over to Peter and she'll finish up. So we went live uh, with the new UI on the 3rd of May, uh, so very recently. And that was a week before, the, or a few days before the May release, the Primo May release, and also it was during our um, break week at Bond, so that was our first semester break week. Uh, so we're also a Total Care customer, and that means uh, we have uh, a few different things. We, are, we have very limited access to the Primo back office, uh, so that uh, we only actually have access to the customization package manager, the reports and Prima analytics. So any customizations or configuration changes that we want to make, we have to submit a case for. And that also means uh, we don't have a Primo sandbox, so any configuration changes that are made are made directly to our production environment. So to start off with, uh, we'll go to the tenth thing, which is uh, I'll just share with you some information about our roadmap and decision making. Uh, leading up to go live. So our original plan was to actually go live with the new UI in January. Uh, however, sometime last year we noticed a couple of things that were on the Primo roadmap for being released in February had been pushed back to the May release and that affected our um, decision to go live. So those few things were um, the A to Z journals list and the browse feature mainly and Citation Linker hadn't even appeared on the um, Primo roadmap until, until then as well. Uh, we also developed a checklist and this really helped us um, to list every single item of configuration change that we wanted to make and also, oh, that was like everything that we wanted to make whether it was before go live or after go live and this really helped us um, see who was responsible for what and also where to go for further information. So as mentioned in the introduction, last year I did some research on, on using the zero result searches in Prima Analytics uh, to find out what issues our users were experiencing in Primo and possibly how I could um, yeah, improve the experience for them. So these, um, the research was presented at the Igloo conference last year and also I did that webinar earlier this year for ANSREG. So with the new UI implementation on the horizon for us, we did decide to hold off on any of these findings that were um, going to be big configuration changes to the UI until we were ready to implement the new UI. 
so just, I guess that was, um, we didn't want to make any changes in the old UI when we were soon going to, that you're launching a whole new UI anyway. And the biggest of those changes, just get to that slide, um, the biggest of those changes was to reduce the number of scopes and tabs we had in our interface. So we actually had six scopes. You can see a little blurry screenshot up there. Um, six scopes and two tabs. And these scopes and tabs, uh, they were in our uh, OPAC ALIF database, I mean, our ALIF um, catalogue, and so they were just moved across into the new, into the old Primo UI. Um, so that's why we had so many at that time. Uh, when I was doing my uh, analysis on the zero result searches, I found that students were often uh, pre-selecting a scope that would negatively affect their results. So by reducing the number of these scopes and tabs that were available to users, hopefully they would uh, focus on the most important task when initiating their search, and that's keyword selection, and not be tempted by um, you know, sc uh, scopes and tabs um, before they had even conducted their search. So now we only have uh, two scopes, so one for all resources and then one for our course resources. Uh, two other recommendations which came out of my research that were implemented in the new UI included a list of suggestions for the A to Z journals list when a search returned no results and also embedding our chat box into the Primo interface so that users could obtain help at their point of need. So with the new UI, we wanted to keep design changes to a minimum, uh, so we decided just to focus on a, key, a, key, a few key elements. Uh, we wanted the colours to match the look and feel of our old UI, which parallels our university website design. We actually had done quite a lot of configure design changes to the out-of-the-box old UI, so you can see the top um, screenshot there shows our old UI interface which was a little bit more intuitive and um, user-friendly than the out-of-the-box old UI. And um, it actually looked fairly similar to the out-of-the-box new UI as well. One of the other things we wanted to do was update the resource icons in the new UI just to make them a bit crisper and clearer. And then we found that there's no footer in the new UI, so we had to find a way to connect um, or keep our branding of Primo as library search and then connect it back to Bond University. So in the bottom screenshot, uh, you can see that we have pushed the library search logo and the main menu links onto a second row and then we've uh, popped the Bond University logo on the top row of the new UI. The uh, Primo development environment available on GitHub really helped uh, us with the design work for the new UI. Um, not only was it more efficient to uh, make changes and see their, um, the effects quickly, but because we're total care, we didn't really have a way to um, easily see changes before we deployed them to our live environment without um, the Primo development environment. So about a month before we went live um, with the new UI, Peter and I conducted a focus group. And it consisted of a really good mix of students from different field of study areas and um, differing levels of interaction with library services and resources. And we did try to focus on labeling um, and terminology used within Primo and their preferences for ordering. And I'll discuss these findings shortly, but. Some of the other things that we found um, in the focus group included the th uh, that students thought the pin icon would pin the result to the top of the results list and not actually save it to their favourites. They asso associated um, favourites with icons like hearts and stars. We also discussed with them uh, removing the easy bib action from the send to options as the free version, which we don't, we don't have a subscription to EasyBib, and so the free version wasn't really useful to students, and nor did it have many clicks according to Prima Analytics, so they were happy for that to be gone. 
Uh, we looked at advanced search with the students as well, and uh, we ended up agreeing upon removing the material type, uh, drop down menu, the language option, and the publication date refinement from advanced search, as these were all available as facets, and students' preferences were to use those facets after they've um, completed their search. So when it came to uh, labelling and terminology, we asked them about a variety of labels and terms in the new UI. Um, tiny, tiny picture. Uh, one of the more interesting findings, which it kind of shows, oh yeah, maybe if you can click on it. Uh, we asked students, so we have Citation Linker enabled in our interface, and we asked students what they thought Citation Linker did without actually showing them. And they thought it was a tool that would help them find uh, citation trail information, so who cited who for a specific <coughs> item. And they were actually quite surprised that Citation Linker was uh, basically a blank form that you would fill in to find a specific item and see whether it was available. So we discussed with them uh, a new name for Citation Linker. Uh, and so after the focus group, we um, watched the Primo May release webinar, that was probably a few weeks after this, and um, found out that Citation Linker was going to be relabeled to Fetch Item. But by this time, we had already agreed with students on a new name, so we just decided to go with that, and um, that's now called Citation Search. So I've just listed up there uh, a few of the other changes that we've made. Oh, one of the more interesting things was that uh, students agreed that Tweak My Results was um, something that they would, they would know exactly what to do with that terminology, whereas preferences for library staff in particular didn't really like the terminology Tweak My Results. But we decided to keep it. So as I mentioned, uh, in the focus group, we did talk to students about ordering of sections and facets. Uh, we looked at the full record view and asked them what they thought about the order of sections here. We felt that it should prioritise the view it and get it sections so you could actually find the availability of an item easily. And the students agreed. So on the screen here, you can see this is what it looked like before we made any changes, and then afterwards, you, you could just see the, the get it sections um, been pushed up above the send to options. So uh, thanks to the Primo email list, I found out instructions on how to actually do this. And um, so I was able to take the JavaScript code that was suggested and just adapt that to suit our needs. And also, I did this in the uh, Primo development environment before deploying it uh, to the live environment. So I actually got to see if what I was doing was actually making any difference or was it working. So that was really handy um, there to have the Primo development environment again. So when we checked with the students about the order of facets, they were generally quite happy with it although they wanted creation date and um, the library facet pushed a little bit higher, so we did that. And then uh, their bottom three facets I've listed there as well, which was interesting to note. They didn't find those ones um, to be particularly useful, so they're now at the bottom of our facet list. So that's all from me. I'll um, hand over to Peter now. He'll finish up the rest of our things. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about a few things that we've just bundled together here as bells and whistles. These are not necessarily new things in the new user interface, but because we were making this big change and we were bundling it all together, we're actually taking this as an opportunity to pr promote them as new features. Um, autocomplete was one which surprisingly we hadn't actually turned on in the old user interface. This is one of the things that we can't do ourselves in the Primo back office, so it was out of sight, out of mind. We never kind of raised it up to the top of our list for attention. Um, when we talked to the students about this in the focus group, they were quite enthusiastic about it. They thought this was going to solve all their problems with their bad spelling and 
mistyping and, and we yet to see how well that actually works from that perspective but um, good luck to them on that one. Um, as Jesse mentioned, we wanted to make sure we had help for um, our students who were getting zero results for their searching, so putting LibChat into the interface was another important thing. We hadn't done that in the past, and I think one of the reasons for that was we weren't able to pop out the chat from the page, and so if we gave someone some help and they quickly went off and followed that, they were going to lose the chat in any case. So that is something that we still want to investigate a bit further and see how we can get that to work. We do plan to upgrade to the next version of LibAnswers, which has new functionality for the LibChat, and so we're hoping that that's something we can work on in that area. We also have some work to look at how that works on smartphones. On a tablet, it's not too bad that the, the, um, the LibChat button is not taking up too much real estate and not obscuring things, but on a smartphone it sits right over the top of Tweak My Results, so that is a bit of a concern for us. Citation trails, although this was in the old Primo UI, it was not as prominent, um, and in the new UI it has a better um, navigation feel so that users don't seem to get so lost when they're looking at cited by or cited in. So that's another one that we're um, promoting as a new feature. Probably the biggest new bell and whistle is virtual browse though. So this was something that we consciously hid when we migrated to Primo in 2015. And the reason for that was that we had a thousand other priorities on our list for go live and we didn't have time to troubleshoot some of the issues we had with how it was displaying. Um, and that, those problems included things like our DVDs and our games use the first three letters of the title as a shelf number, and so that was interfiling with our Library of Congress classification, and so you might get Buffy the Vampire Slayer popping up when you're looking at something, I don't know, what's in the bees, some <laughs> historical thing, I don't know. Um, so that was one thing. Um, and the other one was we wanted to make sure that our customers had a holistic view of our collection, that they weren't just going to be presented with, here's some more print books, a bit like the one you're interested in, but here's the print books and here's also our e-books as well. So we had to log some cases with Ex Libris to follow up on these two things. They were able to do some work to exclude our DVDs and games from the virtual browse. Um, and also to take an LC class number from the bib record in the 050 tag and use that to interfile with our other, um, with our print collections. And um, do I want to go there? Not quite. Go back. Just to highlight this a bit bigger. Okay, so one of the other concerns that we had about it was if they're looking at an, on an e-book in virtual browser, they're just going to have a look in this section, find it, see the class number and rush straight off to the shelf to grab it. We didn't really want them to do that if it was an e-book. And so we talked to Ex Libris also about making sure that when they hover over the record, this, um, has this got a pointer? Without falling off the stage. That in this grey box here, the, um, the class number would appear and at the end of it it would have ebook in brackets. So we're hoping that that's enough to prevent them, you know, making unnecessary races around the library. Okay, communication's always a big issue when you're running a project that's got you know, this is not a huge project, but it's significant enough that there's a number of steps and we wanted to coordinate them, and we had to deal with different parties working with us as well. So um, the four, we had four main groups that we are thinking about with our communication plan. IT services was significant for us because we are reliant on the web team in IT services to help us with JavaScript to some extent and with cascading style sheets and they are also the owners of the design of the university website. And they had previously worked with us when we migrated to Primo in 2015 and done an excellent job and we had lots of positive feedback about the customised interface that we had. So we talked to them very early in advance and booked them in and we thought that it would take about six to eight weeks 
to get the work that they needed to do in place, and so we had that scheduled. Uh, once that kicked off with them, we had fortnightly meetings to discuss the design, plan and monitor how those changes were happening. Um, Ex Libris, of course, was another really important party that we had to communicate with. We had some phone calls with them last year with um, the Unified, let me get this acronym right, Unified Resource Discovery Team um, to talk about timing and the reasons for why we had changed from an original February date to a May date which were the reasons Jesse talked about earlier. Um, and in that conversation, they said to us, yes, for these changes, log them as cases and put dates in as to when you want these changes to happen. Earlier this year, we had an, uh, a call with the Australian support team on a different matter, but we also reiterated with them, this is coming up for us. Um, we've been told this is how to manage them. Just be aware that these cases will be coming through and that we have time um, you know, is a critical matter on some of these. We want these things to happen at certain specific dates. Um, then, of course, we had to actually log the cases. The, the next group, library staff, we added this onto the agenda of pretty much every team in the library and talked to them about it in all of those to tell them what was happening and what we would like them to do to help us out with testing. And then communication was, we would email them and say, okay, testing starting, please have a look at this. And they would report any issues they found back to Jesse via email as well. Um, in terms of our customers, Bond University Student Association is an annual meeting that, well, it's a committee. <laughs> um, and we have, the library has an annual meeting with them in January to consult on all sorts of library services and we talked to them about it and they actually recruited the focus group members for us. So they're a really terrific ally that we've got there. Um, once we did go live, we had an announcement that went up in the student portal and on our website. And um, our focus was not so much that, you know, oh, look out, there's a big change, you need to worry about it, but, oh, there's some changes and here's some great new features that you should look out for and enjoy. Testing. Um, this was done in two parts. Because we had some changes that Jesse talked about, the scopes and, um, what was the other one? Tabs. Ta scopes and tabs. Those changes were made and of course impacted on our old UI as well as the new UI. So we had those done a week in advance of when we wanted to go live so that we could have time for our librarians to test that and provide any feedback to us. Um, and then, of course, we had the actual go live and testing after that to make sure everything was working appropriately. I'm going to have to rush, put my skates on. Um, so all sections of the library were involved in the testing. It was a positive experience for them. They had the responsibility to know how this worked, and so they, were, um, they all found it quite useful. OK, go live. We have a checklist that we have shared with you, if anyone wants it. It's probably not comprehensive because it's bond specific, but I have removed some of that bond stuff out of it. Um, we chose, we settled on a particular timing because we wanted to minimise impact and we needed to make sure we had our resourcing available to do the testing. Despite logging our cases, despite saying we need these things to happen on certain days and having those conversations, it didn't happen on the day that we wanted unfortunately. In the bigger scheme of things, okay, it was a 24-hour delay, but at the time when we had logged it and we were expecting a change to be made and it didn't happen, and then we actually got no response when we're going, can we have an update, what's going on? Um, it became a bit of a concern for us at that point in time. And so we certainly gave Ex Libris some feedback about what was going on here. So they did undertook a root cause analysis. The key thing was the day that we had requested was actually a public holiday in Israel and no one had actually thought, actually, we won't be here to make this change. And of course, there was no one there to then go, oh, look, they've escalated and want to know what's going on. So 24 hours before you even get a, oh, ha hang on, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so that didn't go well. We also gave them some feedback um, about the fact that what they thought was critical and what we thought was a critical trigger was different and that this really should be run with a checklist for customers to work through and decide what things and what order it should happen in. 
Um, and they did respond and say that they plan to do that going forward with other customers. So hopefully you will see a checklist that's maybe more comprehensive than ours. What next? We are planning to improve the login experience. So at the moment we have that page that you can see there is kind of an unnecessary step. 97% of our traffic is bond people and they go, we want them to go straight to this single sign on page that is standard and we'll add the extra link into the alternate login section at the bottom for others. We're having a BX recommended trial starting imminently and Jesse and I will be doing some mobile usability testing as well with some students in the coming weeks. And you can try it out at your leisure. Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>